Well, my name is Dina Patel. I am a HOAS female director for Western Division. And welcome to What's in the Pipeline. Uh, I am pleased to introduce today's moderator, Stephanie Rica, is the editor-in-chief for Hotel News Now, where she manages the content vision and day-to-day -day operations for the group's award-winning daily newsletter. Stephanie has a decade's worth of experience in hotel trade journalism and has been a longtime supporter of AHOA. Please give a warm AHOA welcome to Stephanie Rica. Thank you, Dina. That was a great introduction. And thank you all for coming to our panel this afternoon. Hopefully you can all hear. That sounds good. All right. Well, we will just get right into it because I know we have a quick 45 minutes for this panel and a lot to discuss from our panelists today. So anyway, like Dina said, I'm Stephanie Rick. I'm editor-in-chief of Hotel News Now. And I'm going to let our panelists today introduce ourselves. So starting with Kim over on my right, please go down the line and not only give us your name and your brief bio and title, but tell us how you deal with supply and pipeline issues every day in your day-to-day -day work. And now screaming. we're in business. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Kim Bardul. I'm partner with the Highland Group out of Atlanta. We do feasibility studies mostly, um, and we do them for all sorts of hotels. Um, and we do deal with pipeline issues, um, especially when the supplies starting to build as it is now. Um, when we do feasibility, we have to determine supply and demand and how it's going to affect our client's project. And usually we run it down with the, the franchise rep, maybe city, um, the city offices permitting. But when so much supply is coming in, it's hard to run down. We have to get a little creative. Sometimes we even find out, we research deeply, we find out who the developer is and if they're a seasoned developer and if it's a developer that might get things done or, or might sit tight. So, um, and even if it's, it's disclosed with Smith, Smith Travel as under construction or in the planning, we normally have to market specific, um, apply a probability of those that maybe won't get done. So it's, it's a challenge when it gets like this. Thanks, Kim. Mark, now you don't do anything at all with supplier pipeline no, fact, data um, at all. I'm Mark Woodworth. I'm here to learn something about the hotel business. So I'm going to listen. Uh, uh, I, am, uh, I am Mark Woodworth, and um, I've been in the hotel business uh, all my career. Uh, I focus uh, with respect to the supply issue. Um, we track 60 uh, here in the U.S., 60 of the larger uh, domestic hotel markets, uh, prepare forecasts uh, every 90 days for those markets. And so part of that as you might expect, it's critically important that we understand uh, what is in the pipeline and what's likely to happen, and that will influence our forecasts of supply change for the next typically uh, six quarters. And then beyond that, uh, we've studied history in the sense that uh, identifying what the market conditions are that causes there to be the addition of a room to a market. I think conceptually, but that is a combination of occupancy levels and, uh, and, and pricing and so forth. And we do that and have a discrete view of that for, again, each of these 60 cities and, of course, for the country as a whole. So there's a lot of dynamics around those numbers and factors that play in. Peter, tell us who you are and how you deal with supply every day. Okay. Um, my name is Pete Nichols. I am the National Director of the Hospitality Group with Marcus and Millichap. And uh, like Mark said, I've been in the hospitality space since I was, uh, since I was a kid, since I was 15, 16 years old. And uh, at Marcus Millichap, we broker the sale of hotels. So, uh, you know, supply of new hotels is an everyday thing for us in everything from the large major markets, how's it going to affect the value, to uh, smaller markets, should I develop, should I um, wait, should I hold, uh, how, how should we handle the valuation of the property and then secure the best possible price for uh, our client when we're selling a property. Thanks, Peter and Russ. Uh, yes, I'm Russ Rivard, uh, a managing partner of U.S. Hotel Appraisals and senior managing director of HVS Dallas. And, of course, um, as Kim mentioned, Peter, um, 
We deal with new supply every day. Um, part of our work is uh, in CNV work is uh, feasibility and market studies and, and appraisals. And so you have to look at every job specific assignment and look at new supply equations. So it is everything that we, uh, we deal with as far as new supply. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what factors into pipeline and supply issues are not only the segment that you're operating in, but also the market you're operating in. So I'd like to ask the audience two quick questions before we get into our discussion to just give them up here a better picture of where you all sit in the industry. So raise your hand if the properties that you are working with or on are within top 25 markets. So most of you are outside top 25, correct? Yes? Okay, now how about segments? Um, raise your hand if you're working in economy. All right, how about mid-scale, upper mid-scale? Upper up to luxury. All right, so it seems like most people are sitting in that outside top 25, in that sweet spot right now of mid-scale, upper mid-scale. So that can help direct the conversation, what we're talking about here today. So let's start by, <clears throat> excuse me, going down the line and sharing some gut feelings about hotel supply right now. Because like Kim mentioned, you know, we get that feeling. We know that it's creeping up. Pipeline plays into that. So I'd like to start with Mark with, uh, for this question, but we'll hit all of you here. Mark, give us a quick capsule update of where CBRE sees the pipeline in 2017 and beyond, and really how that relates to current supply demand dynamics. Sure. Um, our current forecast uh, on an annualized basis calls for a 2%, 2.0% supply change, debt supply change in the U.S. in 2017 which happens to be almost exactly what the long run 30-plus uh, year average change has been according to, uh, to SDR. Uh, that's basically going to stay flat, i.e., we think it's going to be right around 2 percent for the next uh, three, four, uh, maybe even as long as five years, which is the end of our forecast period. So from a supply change perspective, it's really the, the longer term view is just sort of average behavior. Now, again, that's the macro level, and some of you might know, depending upon where you sit, you could be seeing lots of new stuff coming up, or basically not at all. So, That's the number. pretty moderate, pretty okay. Yeah, it, it, I was, I'm glad you asked that question, because if, if for the next couple of years, uh, if you're in the economy segment, our estimate is that uh, su the annual supply change is going to be 0.9 percent, so a little less than one. The other end of the scale, if you're in the upscale segment, its uh, supply change over the next two years is going to be north of 13 percent. So again, it gets, depends who you are, what you are, where you are. Uh, you could either be seeing lots of stuff happening or not much at all. Wow, that's a huge gap. <laughs> Kim, what's your gut feeling on supply right now? Well, I mean, downturn occurs every seven or eight years, right? 2009 was our last downturn. We're already eight years in. Constructions, it a pretty all-time high in the past six or seven years, wouldn't you say? So no one's predicting a crash. We're just kind of plateauing. It's kind of, it's okay. It's 2% overall. Um, specifically, extended stay is at an all-time high um, of rooms under construction at 40,000 at the end of 2016. Um, interestingly, there are no extended stay rooms under construction in more than one-third of the largest markets. So there's still... You know, it's not, it's a lot, but it's, there's still room. Boutique rooms are gaining traction as well, and pipeline figures within the top uh, 25 MSA show 28,000 boutique hotels um, under construction. And again, uh, even within the top MSAs and certainly outside, there is still room for those hotels to be developed and likely demand for them as well. So my gut feeling is we're still okay. So once again, that segment and location play in. So Peter and Russ, you guys deal with transactions in the money side. You see a lot. Peter, what's your gut feeling about supply? Um, the gut feeling is, is we've sort of forgotten what normal is because we've gone from such a, a, a depressed point at the end of 2008, 2009, um, to now all of a sudden things are back to normal. And for the last eight years, they haven't been. And we've seen huge growth, we've seen huge improvement, and now all of a sudden things have sort of started to stabilize and settle down. And so gut reaction is we need to kind of do our own gut check and say, wait a minute, there, there's nothing bad out there on the horizon. 
we hear about, is there going to be a downturn? Is there going to be a negative? Is, are, are things bad? No, they're, they're just normal again. And I think we need to remember that. We need to reflect back and see where we came from to why we've gotten to where we are and why things are starting to level out. You can't see 8, 9, 10, 12% growth every single year. You know, as much as I would like that as a broker, I'd love to be able to put that hockey stick up there and say, <laughs> sky's the limit. It's not. And, and realistically, we need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Russ, your thoughts? That gut reaction? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think there's some some definite reasons to be calm about the supply situation. Um, really, when you see the labor costs that are occurring now with new construction, a lot of that's going to slow down the construction uh, hysteric. You know, a lot of the crazy numbers we've seen in the last three years. So I think the, the cost of new construction and the, the tightening of the lending, I think you're going to see 2% makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, and like you said, Peter, I mean, more of a normal growth. So. I, I don't see any gloom and doom. I, I think it's right where it needs to be, and, and it really is somewhat positive. So let me ask the audience another question. Raise your hand if you are actively or close to thinking about buying or selling a hotel. Okay, there's quite a few of, the, uh, of you out there saying that, and, and I think that's a good transa uh, transition to ask my next question, particularly of you two, Russ and Peter. You know, how do things like supply growth and what's in the pipeline affect the sale of a property these days? You know, where do we sit in the cycle where, you know, that's factoring into your decision or to how hotels are being valued? Uh, that's a good question. So it's very important. As a matter of fact, it's critical to consider new supply when you're valuing a hotel. Um, but it just, it kind of depends. It depends on what the new supply is where is it within the market? Does it affect a subject property or not? But when it does, we do have to uh, obviously consider new supply and whatever the demand, it may or may not create latent demand and maybe it'll help the market overall. But a new supply can be a bad thing if it's not in check and if, if the subject property is directly affected. But either way, a lot of times new supply uh, helps the market overall if it's not in an oversupply situation already with latent demand. And what we see is we do show it, but if you have a strong subject property, that new supply may or may not affect it. So it just depends really on what's coming in mm -hmm. and what we're talking, what asset we're valuing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I even go along with that and say it, it becomes a little bit of a, a, a financing question in terms of what it's going to cost to build a new property in that marketplace versus what it's going to cost to acquire a property in the marketplace. If it's going to cost you 20% more to build a property than to acquire a property, then from a valuation standpoint, from a rate standpoint within that marketplace, it's not a bad thing because that new hotel is going to have to have a higher rate just to support itself financially. That's going to help you as the existing hotel in that market. Hopefully, that rising tide raises both hotels, exactly. as opposed to becoming a negative in a in a in a you know a draw a, a drag on the marketplace. Right. Right. So I, I agree with you, Russ. I think that's that's exactly the way to look at yeah. it. Is and 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 again, it's a street corner business. This particular market may be different from that particular market, and whatever the demand drivers mm -hmm. are, whatever that latent uh, demand is in that marketplace, is is really so so specific to those individual markets. Exactly. Yes, Mark. I want to, may I, may, may I ask the audience a question? Yes, you may. Okay. Um, I, first of all, I will ask the question if you agree to participate. Uh -oh. will, you, will you participate? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Right? Okay. A couple of my colleagues just described the current environment as being normal. Okay. I know, thank you. How was I going to ask you that question? <laughs> <laughs> you answer before you even ask. So does, every, does everybody agree that that's a fair characterization of the environment that we're in today? That's normal. Does anybody not agree with that? Aha. Uh -huh. Quite a few. I'm really interested in what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Why do you say it's not normal? Because we're in a rising interest rate environment now. We haven't had that in decades. Rising interest rates? It's like, what are they? Point, point, point something? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, they're going up, but they're, 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 you know, they're so low, right? Lending you tightening, a, okay. You have a GDP at basically slightly above 1% or maybe 2%. Uh, 
So you don't believe you don't, wait, wait, wait. So you don't believe in the Trump effect? No, I'm sorry. Couldn't resist. Okay, so GDP, okay. So I agree with the fact that I don't see anything bad happening anytime soon, knock on wood, but it's certainly not normal. We have Donald Trump as the president of the United States, first hotel leader president. Right? So that's not normal. That should help, yeah. I didn't mean to take over, but I have. Have any of you up here noticed that? Have you, you know, he's saying everybody likes to stay optimistic when it comes to predicting or forecasting these types of changes, but has anybody, I mean, not particularly now, we don't know of anyone saying, okay, there's going to be a crash in two months, but historically, have you known or seen or heard of instances where you're like, hey, we should have listened to that company or that guy or that particular metric when Can you start on that end of the table? Forecasting a downturn. This is I, open I, for anybody, I, right? I think, um, you know, optimistic's one thing. I, I don't want to say I'm optimistic, but kind of like we've said is that it's kind of a normal situation. The thing is, when you have a president right now that wants to do tax reform, and Wall Street loves the guy right now on some of the changes he could make. We have low interest rates historically. We have the U.S. is still the best game in the world. There's a lot of reasons why status quo is okay and, and that there won't be a crash. I mean, who knows? There may be another 9-11. And we have been on a, this rise. But, but really, all the fundamentals right now point to continued, you know, moderate growth. Uh, unless... Trump can't get his tax reforms done. There are some things, some hurdles, but right now there's no reason in my mind, other than you looking at the eight year rise we've had, to consider a, a big reduction in the economy, at least in 2017. I, I, would, I would agree with you. I think that if we what are you gonna say? look out and we try to identify the things that caused the crash in 2008, what were they? Primarily they were financially related. Right? We all saw the movie The Big Short and, and saw how the market came tumbling down. So if you go out and look forward and try to identify where do you see that in the marketplace today? You've got historically low interest rates that have been historically low interest rates. We don't see high default rates right now because we see a good performance of the properties. So do we, are, we, are we really at risk of a bunch of default? I don't think so. We have, as, as Russ said, there's some, some changes that have been proposed. Have they happened yet? No. Are they going to happen for sure? We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. But I can't sit here and say the market's going to tank because maybe something's going to happen. Maybe this is going to happen. Maybe that's going to happen. Maybe the sun's not going to rise tomorrow morning. We don't know that. But if we look at the things that we do know, as, as Mark said, we've got growth rate at 2%, which is normal. We've got below what the, the long-term average of interest rates have been. That's not a bad thing. Yes, interest rates are rising, but rising to where? Five and a half, six percent? I seem to recall there was a time when interest rates were at 13, 14, 15 percent. We're nowhere close to that. So for the immediate future, I don't see us falling off the cliff. I don't see a negative. Should we be aware? Should we pay attention? Of course we should. There's no reason not to. We'd be fools to close our eyes and just blindly go forward. That's not what I'm suggesting. But what I am suggesting is that when you look at all of the factors that are going into it, the cost to develop, the demand that's in the marketplace, the current administration, interest rates, all of those things collectively, I don't see a, a major concern that says, whoa, watch out. We're way overbuilt. New supply is coming in at 5%. Watch out. We've got a huge default rate watch out. We've got businesses leaving the country left and right. Watch out. I don't see any of that. So when I say I'm optimistic or I'm normal, all those factors collectively create a sort of normal environment to look at. That's, that's what I base I that on. I remind one thing. When you are relating with the Trump policies, mm -hmm. it are exactly the same as Ronald Reagan policies, which led to the crash in 2008. 
So if you're going to be comparing exactly the same. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Re Reagan got out of office in 19, what, 88? And in 2008, 20 years later? 1988, Texas was grounded. The biggest bank of Texas, the Republican bank, went under. I don't know. Texas, yeah. 87, 88 were the worst year for Texas after the Ronald Reagan policies in 87, 88. Okay. Well, I, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert of what Reagan did. I do know that some of the things that Trump, and I'm not getting political here. I'm just saying some of the things that Trump wants to do would bring more of the capital back into the United States. That would help tremendously if he can change the capital tax structure. Um, also, the U.S. tax structure. I mean, look at the foreign investment that's coming in. They believe in the United States a lot more than us sitting here. So I, I think that, um, you know, really kind of what Peter said is that um, at least he and I, I can tell, agree, is that we're not really negative about where things are. We're cautious. Cautiously optimistic is where I am. Um, and, and just because we've been on this ride doesn't mean it's going to crash tomorrow. I mean, we're at different times now. And so, anyway, I don't know about the Reagan, uh, you know, how you can compare it now. Well, one way that we've heard this operating environment that we're in right now described a lot as is the new normal. So different things factor in. Kim, what's your take on it and some of these indicators? Ask, I ask Mark why this is not normal. Right. I want to hear his viewpoint. No, no, I don't think I said I disagree with it being normal. Okay. I was just curious if people thought. But um, <laughs> without getting back to the Reagan and all stuff, right? Because um, who knows, right? It's just there's a lot of unknowns and so forth. Um, it, it's a terrific question that you ask about people, particularly us in the forecasting business, because we like to believe we're always correct, right? But, uh, and it's helpful that most people, when they hear our forecast, kind of forget them. So when you show up a year later, they kind of don't remember what you said. But the, rea the, re the reality is this, if we, happen. Go back, if we go back to 2001 and 2008, what actually ended up happening just from kind of the, if you think about like rev par change or the decline that we saw, in each case it was more than three and a half times outside the standard deviations away from the norm. So I don't care what business you're in, you can't predict outcomes like that. Um, uh, what I do distinctly remember happening is that most people don't remember that the recession actually began in the first quarter of 2008. Well, well before the stuff, the bad, the real bad stuff happened in the fall. Um, and that was anticipated. What you will hear, I believe, certainly coming from us and I think others as well, and we've been sharing with our clients for the last six months, you should be preparing for a, maybe a technical recession in 2019, just the way things are playing out and so forth. Uh, and that's built into our, our five-year forecast. We don't think RevPAR is going to go negative that year, but it's going, to be, it's going to be a soft environment. The number one contributing factor is we're running out of employees. We don't have enough labor. We don't have enough human capital to keep the economy going. And that, that's, what, that, that's really what the, the main contributor to that. So it's, we were in a discussion earlier today. It's kind of interesting. Let's assume that you actually thought that was really going to happen, right, that we could have a soft recession 2019. So what would you do today if you thought that was going to happen two years from today? Yeah. Or maybe you said, what wouldn't you do today You'd if you thought? Back off. You would wait. Yeah. You would wait. I would just like to add one point that it's not only we. I've been following the oil forecast, and they also have been terribly wrong. When the curve starts going up, when it will reach 120, they say now it's going to reach 150. Nobody's going to predict it's going to hit 40. So that is the forecasting business in such a way. When it starts going up, people will jump on the bandwagon. It's going to keep going up. But does anybody really do a genuine research in a genuine way to give a realistic picture? Well, no, no. Kim knows how to forecast oil prices, so you, you can speak to that. <laughs> I'll talk to you after the, the panel. That, that's the silver bullet, isn't it? So let's get back into the, into the discussion at hand, which let's take a few things off the table and consider that we're moving forward here knowing that we've got people in the room who are interested in buying and selling, people who are looking at certain markets, certain segments, and brands to put hotels in the ground. 
whatever happens today, tomorrow, or two years from today, it's go your decisions that you make now about those things will factor in. So let's look at markets, hot and cold markets. It's very difficult to sort of quantify hot versus cold, but maybe it's a little bit better to think about markets that are way oversupplied and ones that can stand to absorb more supply. So going down the line, quickly starting with you, Russ, what markets make you worried in terms of supply and what make you say, okay, that one's got potential. I see there's room for growth there. Right. Um, well, I mean, I'll start in the Northwest. You have Seattle. They've had a bunch of supply recently. And, you know, just what I've read, it might have been H&N, but um, really with the strength of the dollar, you have less tourism coming in from Canada and, you know, abroad. And so, uh, Seattle may be affected, uh, and of course, this is just my opinion. Um, Austin's had a lot of growth lately. Uh, Dallas, where I'm officed at. Um, let's see, uh, oh, Nashville. Nashville and, and Chicago has had a bunch of growth. So it, it comes down to demand generators, I think. I mean, you know, I, I, unless you pick apart one market at a time, you don't know whether that, and we t touch base about it, whether that new supply can be absorbed or not. Um, you have to be in that market, you have to understand what are the demand generators, what new demand, latent demand, we've talked about that, that's the demand that hasn't been captured yet, and new supply tends to bring that out in a market. So some of those markets that I just mentioned, keeping New York by itself, but you have mm -hmm. the Nashville, you have the Dallas, you have the Chicago, you have the Seattle, you have the Austin, different markets that have had a lot of supply in the top 10, top 20 tiers or cities, and um, really, it's hard to pick one that you're worried about because you, unless you really study that particular mm -hmm. market, you don't know what the new supply will do. But I, I think it is a concern that there's been a lot of supply, what, 30% since yes. December 2016 over December 2015. Mm -hmm. So there has been a lot of supply, but I'm not really worried that it's oversupply. That's the difference. That's a very good point. Not all supply has to be bad. Peter, good markets, markets you're worried about. I, I agree with Russ on a, a couple of those. I like Seattle. Um, I like Chicago. Um, I also like Atlanta. Um, I think Atlanta's got a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of growth going on in Atlanta, some changing around of the infrastructure in the city. Um, take out the bridge collapse recently. Um, I don't know what that's going to do. Um, but uh, one of those unforeseen market conditions. But, uh, you know, those are the ones. Nashville, I, I keep scratching my head because there's so much new supply in Nashville, and yet it keeps getting absorbed and performance is good. New York is New York. Yeah. 86% occupancy, I think, yeah, is crazy. and 15,000 new rooms coming on board or, or whatever it is. And, and yet they're still running 86% occupancy. Mm -hmm. So that was one that I, I kind of earlier in the year was questioning and saying, is it too much? Yeah. And now I'm not, I'm not so sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's got such great demand drivers um, being New York. Um, but then you get down into the very, very small secondary tertiary markets, and it's so much an, an individualized decision. And you really have to know, roll up your sleeves, get on the ground, and know those individual markets right. and what's driving those markets. And I'll give an example, uh, like Nashville, I, managing director up in Chicago. She, she sees all of the values up there and, and the cost of the of construction and the, what it costs for a room, ADR. She went to Nashville on one of her weekends, and it was $300 a night in Nashville. Now, you can think, how long can that last? I mean, it's not a Chicago. But so you can worry about that a little bit, like the supply coming in. But if they've, they're getting that rate, I mean, it's just amazing. Go ahead. So <clears throat> before I throw it over to you guys, Mark and Kim, I want to switch the question up a little bit. So yes, feel free to identify some hot or not hot markets specifically. But... Address, if you could, particular market types, like, you know, as opposed to a city, talk about hidden spots of opportunity, like suburbs, airport markets, things like that, that we can be considering as we talk about this hot versus not hot market scenario for supply. Kim, start us off. Okay. Markets I would worry about. I'm going to... Um come from the perspective of extended stay and boutique because I didn't mention at the beginning but that's kind of the, our niches in, in our firm. So the extended stay, um, large amount of supply coming in to the, and the extended stay under construction coming in 
in large amounts of supply in about eight markets. Half of those are coming into markets that already are declining in occupancy from comparing 16 to 15. And those would be the energy-related markets. So you have Tulsa and Oklahoma City and Houston and Pittsburgh on the edge of, of the fracking suburbs. So I would worry about those markets. A lot of it's tend to stay coming in there, not sure it can be supported. Um, and I have to say I'm a little worried about Nashville as well. Um, there are about 1,300 boutique hotel rooms in seven hotels coming into Nashville. And there's demand in that market to absorb these rooms, if, especially if they're close to the convention center. But the further out you get from the convention center, it worries me that these on the edge, unless they're serving a, a very underserved niche in the boutique hotel industry, I just worry that, that they may not do as well as they thought. <laughs> mm -hmm. So those are the two markets I'm worried about. Um, I have some markets where there's still room. I'm assuming we're mm -hmm. going to go there yeah. later. But we can talk about segments. Um, it appears to me that the urban centers um, lack a whole lot of extended stay. So urban centers for extended stay I w would be my, my thought. As far as the boutique, life, uh, the lifestyle, which is the more prescribed boutique product, so you go everywhere from, there's a wide variety. You go from La Meridian all the way to the Aloft and, and, and the different scale. But um, those Aloft and, and AC and Indigos, it seems in the airport markets, um, they're lacking. So those are two that I would say maybe are segments of markets that that are underserved. Really interesting perspective. Mark, hot or not hot markets? Um, well, look, Market the, types. Yeah, may I ask the audience one other question? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> is the past a good predictor of the future? How many people think it is? Yeah. <clears throat> the rest of you don't believe the past is a good predictor of the future? <laughs> so how do you figure out what you do every day? Right? Don't you think about what happened yesterday and the overtime that you build up the well, so it, and fundamentally in the forecasting business, we have to have a, a past to be able to study it and understand uh, uh, okay, when those circumstances will present themselves again and therefore we could expect similar outcomes. I, 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 the reason I asked the question is if we compare supply growth over the past five years at the market level to what we're forecasting for the next five years, just to see is it kind of kind of real change in behavior or just more of the same and so forth. And if you look at the top five markets in terms of uh, highest uh, average annual growth in supply over the next five years, now through 2021, number one market in our universe is Austin. In the last five years, it grew at 5%. The next four years uh, per year, the next four, five years, we're predicting 4.3%. Compare that to Nashville, which everybody's interested in Nashville because it's remarkable what's been happening. The reality is, is the last five years, we've only seen an average of a 2% supply growth in Nashville. But we're forecasting a 4.6% average annual change going forward. So in terms of what do you look for when you look for markets, I would submit that those are probably some statistics it's worth looking at and really understanding uh, you know, if it's been strong and it's going to be strong continued, that are the drivers of demand growth, what are they and, and is it realistic to expect? I mean, how many, you can only have so many bachelorette parties, right, MB? <laughs> That's what's driving Nashville is the bachelorette party capital of the yeah, universe. You know, I just, those bachelorette parties. There you go. So, so, but, but, so, so, so again, that's one thing. And it's also interesting from a locational perspective. Uh, over the next couple of years, we think urban supply we're forecasting it to grow at 7.4% over the next 24 months. Contrast that to the small town metro. I happen to think small is the new big right now. That's where we are in the, in the cycle. Small town metro is 2.9% over the next 24 months. So again, a lot of us philosophically, uh, and it's a problem, what kind of money is it you're investing, right? And how long do you want to plant it somewhere? Um, and, and because if it's, if it's short-term money, then if, if me, I'd be a little concerned if we're having tons of new supply, and especially if we hit an economic soft spot uh, at the end of the decade and could find yourselves in some, some, a little bit of a bind. But on the other hand, what we see in small town environments, smaller town environments, there hasn't been and there won't be a lot going on, and they tend to be a lot more predictable. The last thing I would, I would, I would suggest, too, is um, 
Look at, uh, and you can go find, it's all on the web, look at the, the migration data and look and see where are people moving to, okay? And it's very, very different patterns of behavior as you look around the country. And, and markets are losing people. People are, are leaving those communities and markets are picking them up. And, the, and as you would expect, the ones where their, the population is growing and people are moving there is because that's where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, jobs create demand for hotel rooms. So who here in the room is building a hotel? That's a pretty fair amount. So panelists up here, if people in the room are saying, a lot of people are saying they're building in that mid-scale, upper mid-scale segment, yes? Is that a good bet? Knowing that you might be building a hotel today that opens in 18 months, two years. Is that good? It depends. It, it really depends. I mean, there are a lot of smart people out there that uh, study their, you know, what they're doing and invest carefully. And I would, I would propose to say that they've done their due diligence and are building in a smart market that uh, isn't oversupplied already. So, you know, I, I really believe building now is just fine if you can keep the construction costs down. I mean, that's a challenge I, I'm reading about. Um, so, and if you can get the capital to do it. But really, I believe that, again, I hate to give this answer, but it depends on the market. It depends on the asset they're building, the flag, all of that. So I, I, I would say that you can't paint it with a, a brush saying it's not a good idea. Any other thoughts on audience, you're doing the right thing, or hey guys, be considerate of a certain, of any other factors? All right, I think silence means good. I, I, I do have one comment, because I can't be silent. I'm not, I'm not good at that. Um, the, the other side of it is, is, is how, what's the structure of the deal? You've got to look at the structure of the deal. If you're looking at a deal that's got 85% leverage, I would say don't do it. You're, you're probably pushing too hard looking at a market, as, as Mark said, that possibly in 19 we could be looking at some softening. On the other hand, if you're looking at 60% leverage and you've got a, a, a good expectation of return on your equity, then go for it. You've done, as, as Russ said, you've done your market research, you know what you're, you're getting into, you've identified the right flag, so yes, then it's a good thing. It, it all depends on how you're approaching this. Are you, you know, squeezing the last nickel out from under the couch cushions to try and get this deal to go? Then you shouldn't be doing it. You're, you're stretching too far. Um, so I, I think you have to be careful. So here's, here's a more philosophical question for the group. Um, you know, it's been said that the industry likes to build into downturns. That could be what's happening now, maybe, depending on the market. But um, one thing that I, the, the statement that I like is, we're not overbuilt, we're under demolished. True or false? Yeah, it seems like there are a lot of older properties that, uh, in, in, in any market, really, that you'd wonder why they haven't yet. Um, but, you know, a lot of them are holding on to it because they like the revenue they're making and they're maybe going to retire the next year and then they'll consider it. I mean, there are a lot of personal decisions into that. But I would agree with that, that I think there are under-demolished assets right now. And, and, and it doesn't have to be a new hotel. It can be any commercial or whatever the zoning will allow. But yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think I would tend to think that there are some under-demolished markets, for sure, uh, areas. Mm -hmm. Do you see that factoring in as people make decisions on buying or selling or building a hotel in a, in a certain spot? You know, those of you who do feasibility studies. As far as an under-demolished under market? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, for instance, I'm working on a study <clears throat> right now in Greenville, South Carolina, there's probably a 48% increase in supply there, but I'm not worried about it and I'm not saying it's an oversupplied situation because first of all, the downtown there is, is hot, but the product that's there, especially the larger product is old. So, <clears throat> so I mean, yeah, I think that some of those properties need to, it would probably be better to go away. And if you have newer, hotter, neater, fun product, then why wouldn't you stay in those? So, yeah. So it can factor in. We only have a few minutes left because I know our time was tight and I know a lot of people probably have questions. So let's take a couple audience questions. Um, regarding the supply growth, um, I was surprised when you said, what was it, the upper scale 13% growth? Uh, I want to know, do you think that EB5 funding has made a, a debt on that or kind of driven that? Yeah, it's, it's contributed mm -hmm. to it, certainly, yeah. 
Yeah, like, that's where those deals are going. EB5. He's yeah. asking whether EB-5 financing yeah, contributed to that I didn't hear supply growth at the top yeah, end of the market. Yeah, yeah, I would say, I mean, really the yeah. foreign investment, there's a lot of foreign investment coming in the U.S. And so obviously those transactions, uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of reason of the new supply. And, and they want to build good properties, too. So, yeah, I would say yes. They usually come in at the upper end. Any other questions? Yeah. In the back, okay, she's, sure. Dina's yeah, coming. What, are, what are you seeing trends for the San Jose, San Francisco market? San Jose, San Francisco market. Oh, it's, uh, it's terrific. I mean, the Mos Moscone being closed out for renovations for a couple of years is creating some, some temporary softness. But that's oh. a real. They can probably hear him. Can you hear him? Can you hear me? I just made that part up, so I won't be able to repeat it. So. <laughs> no, but, no, but the. Uh, no, long term, and I talked about the migration patterns and people want, want to, to go there and so forth. It's, we'll pass. Uh, it's real strong. I, I, I want to ask another question. Okay, but do it in the mic. I'll do it in the mic, okay. okay. Now, um, we're talking about all this happy stuff up here, right? Airbnb hasn't come up. Okay, the, that just, was going to be my last question. If you oh, can hijack well, it, Mark. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, then I'll be quiet. Well, here's, I, I have a theory that, and hopefully, once we have enough historical data, it will either prove it right or wrong, but I'd love to bounce it off y'all, that I think the hypothesis is that occupancy levels in the United States will be permanently higher, okay, higher than they would be if we had never seen Airbnb. Hotel occupancy. Ho traditional hotel occupancy will be permanently higher because of Airbnb. Because it got people traveling? Well, okay, but you understand, the, the, I mean, the, I think my question is counterintuitive. Wouldn't you think that Airbnb is taking the food off the plate of traditional hoteliers? Raise your hand if you're worried about Airbnb as a supply factor. Well, a couple, it's not it's too certainly many. The AHLA, thankfully, is very focused and worried about it and trying to get to a level playing field. I, I submit that, that, that hypothesis in the sense that um, Airbnb, as I know you know, that supply is very fluid. Okay? It responds when the market incentives are present to, to, to meet that demand. Okay? Whereas the rest of us, we build these things for the next 40 years and we're there whether we got a customer or no. So at least from a pure economic theory, theoretical perspective, that if you have the ability to, per, per, to create supply only when the demand is present for that supply, the overall performance of the, in, this, in our case, the traditional hotel market, in the long run, should be higher. I so like if, you, that if, theory. if you invite me back in five years, we'll have enough data that we can see. If that would sure be a that. great theory to talk about over a drink at the bar, and unfortunately, we do have to wind up here, but I'd like to give everyone the chance for one last comment, and we're going to riff off that. So we've talked here today in our quick time period about our new normal picture of supply growth and pipeline growth. Knowing what you know now, and starting with Kim, because we've got to pass that microphone down, what do you think is the biggest worry? What's your biggest worry when it comes to look at these supply and pipeline numbers? This is what would really hurt it. What's your worry? Uh, my worry... My worry would be that lending would, would get tighter and tighter and it would cough everything back and, and cause us to stall out. Great. We gotta take the mic and pass it down. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> All right, Peter, biggest worry. I think my biggest worry is the herd mentality. And people see a market that they like and all of a sudden instead of a market that needs one or two more hotels, it's got 12 more hotels. That's great. Rust, close us down on your biggest worry because, hey, if we started out with optimism, we'll end with a little pessimism. All right, I got to, that, that's hard for me sometimes. Um, I, I, you know, I really think the economy, I, I think that, you know, um, any building right now, it does make sense, but if certain things happen to the market for whatever reason, I think the economy would be my biggest concern. I'm not concerned, but if I was to worry, I think it'd be what could happen to the economy. 
All right, great. On that note, thank you for bearing with us and join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panel. Uh, that was a great discussion.